Kenya is an interesting country. We are a population that is mainly made up of youth, with the average age of a Kenyan being around 20 years of, uh, 20 years of age. These young people have energy, they have drive, and they have ambition. However, they lack the opportunities and the resources they need to be able to make their dreams come true. Unemployment is a global catastrophe, and it takes innovation, investment, and commitment among all stakeholders. The problem we face in terms of unemployment, in terms of um, slow economic development can be unlocked by unlocking the power of, of enterprise. Speaking of innovation, the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund was founded for this very reason in 2019. The Catalytic Jobs Fund is about the best of Kenya. This is about entrepreneurship, this is about innovation, and this is about job creation. And why it's so exciting is that it just covers the whole country. The Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund aims to test innovations that have the potential for large-scale job creation. So the UK is really proud to support the Jobs Fund. This is about modern partnership. We have a very strong economic partnership already with Kenya, but this is about taking it to a new level, more innovative, more digital, and linking up the ecosystems between our two countries. The KCJF Business Competition 2020 has been a long and worthwhile journey. We are very excited about today because today is a, a culmination of the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund business competition process which started in February when we did a call for applications and we received 850 applications from across 44 counties in Kenya. In this year's competition, the panel of judges comprises of entrepreneurs who have not only been successful in their fields but have the know-how to determine which business has the potential to create large-scale impact. This year we have a very exciting and diverse uh, panel of judges who bring in different expertise to the table. Um, obviously, as we are considering picking the, 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 the top five winners, we are looking at different aspects of the business. So we are looking at, um, you know, whether the businesses are bankable and whether we can invest in those businesses. We're looking at whether those businesses are addressing a specific need in the market. We're looking at whether those businesses have the right components in terms of the team, the brand, the product to make them successful. Starting with the Chief Judge Dashan Chandaria, the Group CEO of Chandaria Industries, the large tissue, liquids and hygiene products manufacturer and distributor in Eastern Central Africa. Joram Winamo, CEO of Sandbox, a permanent residence of over 20 professional disciplines providing needed support for business growth. He is also the managing director of Wild International, a consulting and training company that supports entrepreneurs. Estandeti, an executive director at the East Africa Venture Capital Association, EAVCA, which represents the private equity industry in East Africa and provide a voice for industry players to raise awareness and engage on regional policy matters. Fred Murimi, MD, Centum Capital, with an MBA focused in finance. He has a history of working in the investment and private equity industry. Terian Chebet, founder and CEO of Kiara Organics, one of Kenya's leading homegrown skincare brands. She is a media and communications professional with more than 15 years' experience in media practice and media leadership. Just like in 2019, the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund has narrowed down the finalists to these 10. Five of these entrepreneurs will walk away with a capital of £100,000 each to invest in their business. Hello, judges. I am William. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Zumi. Zumi is revolutionizing apparel retail in Africa. When I first moved to Kenya about five years ago, I discovered something crazy. A second-hand H&M t-shirt costs more in Nairobi than it does brand new in London. Zumi is putting e the power of e-commerce technology into the hands of informal retailers. We have a mobile app that we're developing that enables retailers to restock with the click of a button. We provide free same-day delivery to our retailers to save them the hassle and the cost of going to the market themselves. We use our order data to provide them with financing options which are responsible to help them grow their businesses. And because we're aggregating the demand of hundreds of retailers, we're able to get the cheapest prices from suppliers and pass on this cost savings to our customers. So to capture this big opportunity, Zumi has a simple business model. From our experience at Amazon and Jumia, 
we have designed a lean and asset light model that's built to scale from the very outset. Zumi acts as a marketplace that connects informal retailers with suppliers. So how does it work? We have a team of sales agents who go into the market and onboard retailers for the first time. Then those retailers place an order through our app or with a sales agent, and we deliver the same day to our customers. Now, the reason we love the Zumi model is it's both large in scale and large in impact. When we combine the cost savings from delivery and the cost of goods with the catalytic impact of credit, we're increasing our retailers' income by $250 a month. That's a 50% increase. Finally, the KCGF grant would be pivotal for us. We've been already in conversations with Series A investors, and these use of funds would be used to hit the milestones we need uh, to unlock that Series A investment. What, what, what are the goods here being sourced? Are they secondhand clothing? Uh, so we are uh, acting as a marketplace. So some of our supply is secondhand clothing. Some of it is new clothing, uh, which is imported. And uh, a big focus for us at the moment is uh, the partnerships that we're establishing with local manufacturers. What's your competitive edge? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. So there's, there's really two things. Um, number one, um, with scale, uh, we, we achieve the network effect of, of growth. The, um, the more we scale, the cheaper the prices that we can get from our suppliers and the more cost savings we can pass on to our, our, our customers. And for any new entrant coming in, that's a very, very difficult for, thing for, for them to compete with. And it's a significant value proposition to our customers as, as we've seen so far with, uh, with our growth. So I'm Voss from Jujenga Academy. There are 7 million unemployed youth in Kenya that lack the access to safe and dignified work. These are the beneficiaries of Jujenge. 85% of our students never touched a laptop before our program. 96% were unemployed, and almost a third are orphans or homeless at one point. We build the infrastructure to enable base of the pyramid workers to break the cycle of poverty with data labeling income. We are one, a training, two, a job, and three, the infrastructure to permanently access that job. But our core competency comes from our community roots. Jujenge developed over three years by listening to the needs of orphans in Nairobi and from surrounding areas. That's how we're able to take them from no computer literacy to earning 20, sometimes 30,000 shillings a month from online work. How do we do this? Data labeling. It's the human labor required to train artificial intelligence. It's how Tesla teaches its cars to self-drive. They say it's the biggest bottleneck to the growth of the machine learning industry and that as AI grows, it's set to become a billion dollar market by 2023. We think it's the easiest skill set to teach low skilled workers and the market has untapped potential for jobs, unlike highly specialized markets like coding where the market saturates very quickly. We've already digitized half our training curriculum. When we fully get an e-learning platform, we can train thousands of workers without buying a single laptop because we'll be utilizing pre-existing computer labs in universities and schools across Kenya. In short, we want to turn every computer lab across Kenya into an income generating hub for the community. And that social franchising will allow us to achieve exponential scale by tapping into the existing community networks of partners. With a vote of confidence from you all, we can signal to the international data labeling market that Kenya should be their next country of expansion. Just um, quickly, just take us through what the experience of onboarding um, is like, um, especially from a social impact perspective. How do they find out um, about you? Do they come in, stay on as students? Do they train and then they leave at some point? So from our, our strength is in the community involvement. Through the leaders, through the, you know, the youths themselves, they are very proactive. They want their brothers and sisters to succeed and they come on board. So it's very easy to take the world out there. Even through colleges, just before COVID, they were there. We were trying to get into, especially the small colleges within the community. I said, Tell, come train us, you know, we pay you at a fee so that we can have at least uh, an output for our, you know, for our, st oh, for our students. Hello, judges. My name is Dixon Ayuka and I'm the co-founder of Ujuzi Kilimo Solutions and we are out to bring data-driven farming to the world's smallholder farmers. Low productivity is a challenge to many, many smallholder farmers. Right now, farmers are making an informed farming decision precisely on the use of inputs and the challenge is because 
they are depending on agronomic experts to provide these services to them. Uh, for, for, for each um, agro expert, they need to reach 5,000 farmers. So ideally, it's impossible that a, a farmer will ever get to be served by an, uh, by an agriculture expert. This is resulting into declining productivity. Farms in Kenya today are producing at only 30% their full potential. This as compared to farms in developed nations. This is a $700 loss in productivity each and every season. We have developed the first proprietary patent pending sensor technology to enable smallholder farmers precisely determine the levels of nutrients in the soil, send all this data to an online platform where it's analyzed and the farmer receives precise actionable recommendations directly into their mobile phone. So this device is provided to the field agents who go out there and provide the service to the smallholder farmers. We are targeting smallholder farmers who are farming in, in a farm between 0.5 acres and 5 hectares. And in Kenya, we have 4.5 million such smallholder farmers. And in the region that we are working in, which is uh, Rift Valley and Central Province, we are, have 2.7 million smallholder farmers. By the year 2025, Ujuzi Kilimo is targeting to reach 18.5% of this population, which is a $10 million opportunity based on the $20 uh, the, the farmers pay per, per, per farming season. Our device costs at only $1,000 as compared to $5,000 which our, our competitor's device costs. Therefore, we can actually provide this service at a cheaper price as compared to them. And we just don't provide agronomic advice for these smallholder farmers. But throughout the crop growing period, we have a platform that provides them with crop, manage, crop management advice and even market information by the end of the season. And that is why I'm welcoming you all today to ensure that we're able to reach these farmers by this particular year. Thank you. Um, is this a service that's required every year, every planting season, or is it once off? And then how would you uh, generate future revenues once the soil testing is done? Yeah, so uh, ideally, a soil testing should be done each and every uh, time that you are changing a crop in your farm, which is twice a year. But right now, what you're seeing is farmers are doing it once a year. Um, but uh, uh, besides like offering the service, we also have the data platform that provides uh, crop management practices as a service to these smallholder farmers, and they can pay for that. Okay. Do you have a subscription fee for that yes. platform? Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the cost? Uh, the yet, the cost is... Uh, Five, uh, five, five dollars per, per farming season. Yes. Okay. Don't go anywhere. We still have more innovators buying their time to make their pitch. Want to know more about the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund and be updated on the next call for proposals? Go to www.kenyacatalyticjobsfund.org. Welcome back to the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund Business Competition, a show that seeks to test and invest in cutting-edge innovations. With incredible innovations already pitched, it's clear this competition is going to be a tough one to judge. My name is Yvonne. I'm from Mionga Fresh Greens. Mionga Fresh Greens is a company that's been in export of fresh fruits and vegetables for the last five years. I started this business because I wanted to help empower women in farming. However, my biggest pain right now is that we have to leave so much fruit behind at the farm. It's almost 40% of everything we receive from farmers does not meet the export expectation. And it's not just for me, it's for everybody across the industry. What that translates to is a waste of resources, a loss of income for the farmers, as well as a loss of opportunities for uh, the future generation because fruits are seasonal. You either have to have idle factories part of the year 
or you have to travel long distances to get raw materials. So let me tell you about our solution to this uh, problem. Our innovation is to have the factory going to the farm. Based on the seasonality of fruits, you have a mobile fruit factory that can go to the farm and process the fruits at the farm depending on when the fruits are in season. So what this helps you to do is one, Farmers who couldn't sell the produce, the fruits we were leaving behind, they can now in, earn income from it. And that's about 25% more income they didn't have before. Again, we can be operational throughout the year. Consistency, reliable supply of products is something that anyone in manufacturing values very much. Thirdly, we are reducing the food waste plus because the factory is going to the farm, we are creating employment at the farm gate level in rural Kenya. And so as a company, we've already invested in digital traceability. We are one of the companies that is doing that. And our customers find that really interesting. And you'll have a chance to try that. You just take the product, scan it, you know exactly where you got the product from. First of all, this tastes great. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. I'm, I'm literally going to go home with this back. Mm -hmm. It's and if you then le let us it. know where you're already retailing at. No. Yeah, I really like it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, how much waste have you, like, do you have any numbers? So the farms that you're going back and you're pulverizing and drying, like, how much reduction is there? Like, are you going down to zero waste um, in terms of the, uh, the crop that comes out of that farm? Or, like, how much waste are you coming down to? The amount of waste we experience, we are actually helping to reduce, is about 35%. So we cannot uh, reduce the waste by 100%, but at least we're reducing it by at least 35% what they would not be able okay. to sell. My name is Graham Benson. I'm a co-founder and director of market development at ID Technologies. So thanks for having me. Today, the problem is that 70% of the dairy in East Africa moves through informal value chains. These informal value chains are unable to deliver um, quality assurance to consumers or good buying prices from farmers. These value chains are highly fragmented and really lack economies of scale. And so they're, ve they're really, really inefficient. They have far too many links. And what this means is that farmers don't have control or, vision or visibility over the pricing, while consumers really have to make a decision be between buying quality milk or being able to afford the milk. So Zaidi's solution is to digitize and vertically integrate the entire value chain, managing the milk all the way from the farmers directly to the consumers. We do this by deploying digital solutions that drive previously inaccessible value all the way to the farmers while, while unlocking access to the market on the consumer side. So on the supply side, we provide an ERP-based mobile phone solution to dairy traders who ultimately become like our agents and buy milk from their farmers and deliver it to us on a commission basis. On the demand side, we install milk vending machines with, that are IoT enabled in small shops in urban areas and then sell our milk through them. Because we maintain ownership of those ATMs, the shopkeepers don't have to worry about the upfront cost or the ongoing maintenance. Furthermore, because they, the shopkeepers are earning a commission off of the milk, they're not incentivized to sell milk when it goes bad like other ATM operators are. Today we're buying milk for about 35 shillings a liter. Um, it takes us, that includes the commission that we give to the agents. Um, it takes us about 11 shillings to process, transport, and sell each of those liters, which we can sell for an average price of about 63 shillings to the consumers. This gives us about 27% gross margin or about 17 shillings um, in, in profit. We need the funds from KCJF in order to refine and prove the business case out to help us build the foundation that we're really looking for to, to scale. We need to further develop the ERP software that we've been using in order to help us drive more value to the farmers, supporting the thousands of farmers that we're, we're looking to work with while creating hundreds of new jobs. We also need to refine and improve upon the, the distribution and dispensing technologies that we have in place today that we really want to ensure that quality products are reaching the customers safely. Okay, um, what's, what's the ideal location for the ATMs, like where do you have the three and is yeah. that the ideal location for where you would have the future ATMs and then what's it like around servicing and maintenance of the ATMs? Yeah, um, so the ideal location is something that's polymorphic really. Um, mm -hmm. Our criteria is that it's a, it's, a, it's a shop that sells FMCGs. We haven't really nailed down whether it's a small shop or a big shop. We want to try and target the low income communities, right? So our two, we have two ATMs in Kalangwari and one ATM in Kibera. 
Kibera is vastly underserved, whereas Kawangwari is, is, has a lot of uh, competition there. But we're doing very well in that market because we're, we're building that trust with the, with the consumers. Um, because there's already ATMs in the market, milk yeah. ATMs in the market, and milk is also generally a commodity that's available. Yeah. Um, so I see the, this sector as having very low barriers to entry, if yeah. possible none. How do, you retain, how do you retain your competitiveness? Is it just competing on price or is there something else you could do? Well, so, so to that point, I think that there is, the barrier of entry is the cost of the ATMs, right? And, and being able to, to access, access them. Um, I think that the, our competitive edge is really going to be um, like the engagement that we have with the consumers, the trustworthiness of us over time. Um, I think ultimately, we want to just continue to have a higher, higher quality assurance, um, and that's really going to make us stand out in the future. Yeah, my name is James Sambani from uh, Value Villages, uh, food and leather production. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, poultry feeds in Trukana. We grew from a humble fish agent. Uh, by fish agent is just a nice term for hawkers. And then, you know, we grew and we are able to, to build two factories at the moment in Shukana. Our factories produce different products from the fish. Um, our main product is fish fillet and fish mouth. Uh, currently, we are also producing fish meal, uh, fish leather, which is a story for another day. Okay, we are building a very strong foundation. Uh, Three million monthly sales. We have 18 distributors in six counties, 42 employees, uh, 300 fishermen. We are currently working with seven products a 25% uh, operating margin at the moment. And uh, we like our product because our fish from Trukana is very tasty. Uh, it's very good, no pollution on Lake Trukana. And this uh, is really good. It's given us uh, a good market base and we have a strong cost advantage compared to Victoria. And then our product development is using waste to, to expand now into livestock feed. So this waste is actually what we're talking about right now. Okay, so we have everything we need. The factory is set up, we already have the machines, everything is ready. What we just need is some working capital and a generator. Um, so that's why we're asking KCJ for 14 million shillings. We've already invested about 22 million. Uh, looking at uh, our finances, you know, with this feed business, we can, it will increase our operating profit by another 3 million and 60% uh, operating margin, uh, a very conservative estimate. Yes. Uh, what's the maximum total capacity that you can fish, uh, say, in a, in a year? And are there restrictions around how much you can actually fish so that it caps the demand of uh, the fish that you get and therefore the feeds that you produce? Yeah. Okay, uh, currently uh, we are working with uh, a few fishermen from an area on the lake, uh, on the lake uh, between uh, central, and we are somewhere in between central and north. So we're working with just about 300 fishermen. And uh, per day, they are able to bring in about one ton, one ton of fish, okay, on a daily basis. Mm. Uh, we've not even gone to north to the lake. We are yet to expand. So definitely the capacity is there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's a big lake. The area is about 6,405 mm -hmm. square kilometers. We are covering a very small area, actually not even 10% of it. My name is Tommaso Menini. I am the founder and director of African Agency for Arid Resources Limited. We work with commodities from arid and semi-arid lands. Now, these are aloe cosmetics. They are both body lotion, sorry. Here we have frankincense. The frankincense that you've seen before, yeah, it turns into these essential oils. And frankincense was called the king of essential oils. And we have so much of it in Kenya that has been virtually untapped. We then, we then um, looked at uh, uh, the box. This box has been a huge seller because we can give you wholesale prices when you buy only 10 and above. And Shia Butter has been a last addition which is selling very, very well. And of course, we do bulk for export, which is our um, main. Our presence is pretty good. In only one year, 
from the launch of this line, the retail line after much wholesale, we are already in two, three countries, sorry. We are in South Sudan, we are in, we are in Kampala, Uganda. We have 10 vendors here in Nairobi. We have a, a very strong e-commerce platform. Now, we do very well with, uh, with private label. We are the only company in Kenya that allows you to do private label. So we bottle, we label, you just take it and sell it. We've done that for a number of companies. Why us? Why now? Because the frankincense uh, trees are actually dying out in Somalia and ours are doing really well here. I really hope that they don't all die out, of course, but right here we have plenty of them. We are not tapping them. We can do a lot. We can reach 3.5 million just here in Kenya with one essential oil, which is frankincense, which we tap and collect through our collectors, of course, and uh, the, 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 the acres that we want to start will also give us plenty of aloe products. What we will use the funds will be to create nurseries. The nurseries will lead to aloe plantations and we will, um, what we will do, we will do the same number of acres each year, year after year in different counties, because there is plenty of arid lands in Kenya. The great thing about this project, this initiative, our work is scalability. There is so much land in Kenya that is completely unused and forgotten in all of these arid lands that we can scale up these aloe plantations nearly everywhere. Aloes can grow on rocks, guys. We have so much land that is completely unused and it's communal land, which is what we want the community to own. Yeah, I wouldn't own the, the land, the communities would. So next year we would uh, start with Iziolo and Samburu, the following year with Turkana, following years with, uh, with Garissa, and why not uh, expand regionally? We already work in Uganda. We can get to South Sudan or Ethiopia. All of these counties have arid lands, plenty of. Um, I'm in the skin care business as well, so I know um, what the margins I like, especially on, on essential oils. Yeah. Um, however, it's also dominated a lot by uh, multinationals. For instance, you know, sometimes as a Kenyan, if you want to buy coconut oil from Mombasa, they say, no, it's all locked in because it's going to, you know, X, Y, Z. So what are you doing? One, for the local market, yep. um, because it's a growing industry here as well. And then a uh, second question on the white label and the opportunity that you see in that space. There is no good quality that is produced locally for the local market. Kenya produced incredible quality of essential oils. Mm. So we are the only one here that truly invested on the domestic market and is paying off. Kenyans are becoming more and more aware of what they put on their skin. That's also true. because 65%, as you would know, of what you put on your skin goes on your bloodstream. You want to make sure you don't put rubbish. It's time to take a short break. Don't touch that dial. An idea might just pass you by. Want to know more about the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund and be updated on the next call for proposals? Go to www.kenyacatalyticjobsfund.org. Welcome back to the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund Business Competition. A few more pitches are yet to be heard, and soon we will find out which five will walk away with an investment that will impact the direction of their business. My name is Jahil Oliver. I'm the CEO and founder of Hello Tractor, an agricultural technology company looking to partner with KCJF to bring affordable tractor financing to entrepreneurs servicing smallholder farmers. Hello Tractor came into Kenya to address a glaring gap in the market. Farmers notoriously plant late and undercultivate due to a lack of power for their fields, whether it be manual or mechanized. Now, mechanized power is 40 times faster than manual labor and is also one third the cost. It brings benefits, including yield improvement. And of course, it's just difficult to toil out there in that hot sun, working the land in advance of the season. However, challenges in bringing mechanization into Kenya 
revol revolve specifically around most of the production happens by smallholder farmers. Their demand for services is, are fragmented across large geographies. So as a tractor owner, it's difficult to identify the demand. And also as that tractor owner, there, because these assets are so expensive, it's also an issue to ensure that you're paid the money you're deserved when you deliver these tractor services. We came with a technology solution to solve for that problem. It starts with a low cost monitoring device that fits onto any brand and any class of tractor. That gives the tractor owner visibility into where their tractor is, what it's doing, fuel consumption, and then of course, bookings coming in from a separate application used by agents in the community coordinating demand, making sure that tractor service is efficient. Lastly, we built apps for financial institutions to take data coming off that tractor and have visibility not only into where their collateral is, because these are of course asset-backed loans, but also data on the utilization of the tractor. So they know tractors are at risk of default before it even happens. KCJF is supporting the catalytic financing to kickstart this last mile business. We'll be financing five to 10 tractors. We already have private sector money to support the financing of these tractors. We're then taking this investment to build out that infrastructure to ensure that every single tractor has this pre-organized book of business before it even leaves the yard. I'm struggling a little with your proposal on how you are looking to grow. Mm -hmm. um, listening to you, it's almost like hearing Uber saying, we now want to go and own cars, or Airbnb saying, we now want to go and own houses. Because uh, it sounds like you are... It's similar to those businesses in that these workers are also incentive-based. They get a piece of the cut as they deliver services, right? So all of our, everybody in this kind of value chain is incentive-based. As a tractor owner, I'm paid as I deliver services to the farms coordinated by my booking agents. As a booking agent, as these services are completed, I'm paid a commission for that, right? So Hello Tractor doesn't own assets, and we certainly don't own people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. My name is Ryan Joka. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Digiduka, where we're building digital solutions for kiosks. Now, I built my career over nine years in the telco industry, where um, I really fell in love with the power of digital financial services to transform lives. Uh, and that's why our mission at Digiduka um, is to bring kiosks into the digital economy. Uh, and this means that we are now helping them accept digital payments, any form of digital payments, be it mobile money or, or, or banks. We're also um, helping them be able to sell digital inventory, um, such as um, KPLC tokens or tickets. Um, and we also want to, them to be able to put their inventory online um, and, and get them into the e-commerce space. Now, our platform makes uh, transactions cheaper for customers by up to 70%. It brings more earnings to kiosks, up to 500% more earnings. And for digital service providers, um, it's an open, distribution network of 75,000 retail locations that can sell their services. Now, uh, we're currently live on several platforms uh, with an Android application, USSD, WhatsApp and web. And we've already integrated with 12 billers, so you can pay 12 different bills. Um, and we are also integrated with three mobile money providers. Now, going forward, we want to add 25 banks um, as well as 20 other billers. Uh, our application has been received very well with a 4.9 star rating out of 5 on the Google Play Store. Now, we've made amazing progress over the last 120 days uh, with over 3,000 uh, new kiosks uh, on our platform and processing about 8 million shillings worth of transactions. And we've been able to do this by re while still reducing the customer acquisition cost from the current 300 shillings, from an initial 300 shillings to a current 160 shillings. Now, we've been do, be able to do this um, with a very scalable model um, that has gone quite viral. Um, and we want to be able to further leverage this by putting in place an incentive for our customers to refer within their networks 
and therefore we are able to, to tap into more kiosks. I can already do a lot of the payments um, that you're doing directly on my phone. Why would I, why would I come to a Digiduka? Today you have two, two main options of paying your bills. Um, you either incur the high premium of a mobile money transaction fee or you have to go to the various points of service. So for example, you have to go to Kenya Power Banking Hall to make the same payment uh, for free, right? So what we're doing is we're almost bringing the convenience of mobile money, but while, lawyer, while lowering the cost by having the shopkeeper facilitate this payment. So you, instead of going all the way to a Kenya Power Banking Hall, you just go to your local kiosk. Uh, and because we're incentivizing this person through the commissions that we're paying uh, to be able to facilitate this payment, you can do that. Um, and then it, it's also, I mean, uh, at a lower cost. Good afternoon. My name is Francis. I'm, I'm the founder of Keep It Cool. At Keep It Cool, we are disrupting the fish value chain by decentralizing cold chain access. We have a lot of fishy problems in the fish value chain. And for Mr. Omondi, who is a fisherman and a small-scale fish farmer, he has a lot of problems in, because he can't seem to find market for his fish. On the other hand, uh, the buyers who show up to buy the fish do not always show up on time and not always taking the size of fish that he has at the prices that he wants. In addition to that, since Fangano Island is not connected to the grid, he lacks storage for his fish. On the other side of the value chain, we have Mr. Kamau. Mr. Kamau is from central Kenya. Uh, he doesn't know much about fish. In fact, he doesn't know how to gut, to fill it and all that. Uh, his suppliers, again, always shows up late and um, the size of the fish that the supplier brings is not what he always or his customers always want and the pricing is always up and down. Uh, the most important thing for Mr. Kamau clients is actually the source of the fish. They want to know where the fish is coming from and that determines whether they're going to buy or not. On the other hand, because of the upfront cost, he can't afford the storage. Our solution is this innovative idea. We're providing the cold chain from the first mile to the last mile. In addition to that, instead of pushing the products to the retailer and telling them to sell, we, all demand is being triggered by the retailer. That, that makes it very efficient and reducing post-harvest losses 100%. On the other hand, it's digitized and it has compressed all the, or, or collapsed all these middlemen into one platform. And this end-to-end -end, uh, cold chain is smart and traceable. This is how the retailer does it. So we have this app, it's available on Android, and we map the orders of the retailers, they place the order, and they put the preferences of the consumers, be it uh, small size, big size, fillet, whatever. And we, we, we use this uh, data and information and we close the orders by 9 p.m. So when you get to the retailer, both the rider and the retailer has an app. There's a digital handshake and we also on the other side have free cooling services for the retailer. Uh, as far as they guarantee us, demand. Our cooling boxes are smart, they are IoT enabled, they can work with or without electricity and they are seven times cheaper than ice. So we have set aside 40,000 pounds to co-invest with KCJF on this. Uh, we are going to set up small processing and sorting centers around the lake. Uh, we are going to train our people, the riders, uh, the handlers, uh, about uh, SOPs and the best practices when it comes to fish and handling. Uh, we are going to improve our technology on traceability uh, and also to, bring, to bridge the digital divide, we are going to develop uh, user-friendly for those people who do not have smartphones. And 50% of our fund is going toward expand, expanding the fish market by providing 100 coolers and activating 100 lease sellers. And most of, also part of that is going to go to, towards the working capital. You're not going to earn anything on the coolers. Yes. It is actually, so once you put a cooler at a retailer, yes. you expect them to buy from you. Yes, but there is a KPI. You must sell more than 20 kgs of fish per week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And just to clarify, you have got 300,000 pounds of seed funding at the moment? Yes. Okay. Not, not at the moment. In the beginning of the year, then we have used all that to build the attraction that you have seen and recruit more agents and expand the supply chain. So what is it? Let's, let's say, for example, last month, how much did you do in revenue? Uh, we sold uh, 40, around 40 to 45,000. Uh, uh, okay, let me just say specifically about $4,100. So $4,100, and that is despite having restaurant closed and uh, butcher, some of the butcheries closed because of the uh, you know, COVID situation. 
After hearing all the innovative ideas, um, Mionga. it's time for the judges to determine which five businesses deserve the investments the most. I didn't see a clear flow of it plugging into yeah, the current yeah. business. And that worries me when people sure, yeah, sure. feel distracted. Anyone else want to go? But I agree, a tough space, but also I liked him as an entrepreneur. Mm. He mm. seemed to have his answers. Yeah, mm. he, and he knows his market very yes. well. Yes. Yes. And he knows his business well. If they get the business model right, I think it would be a really good business. I'm looking for innovation here. So mm. it might go wrong, mm. yes, but mm. I feel like this is what they think would be able to solve whatever gap that they've been seeing um, over the years. How they're looking to grow, I think we'll land them in problems. Because mm. mm. they're now talking about taking on more on balance sheet mm. finances. So they're moving away from technology. It's time to find out who will walk away with close to 14 million Kenya shillings in investment. We really need to thank the British government through the British High Commission in uh, Kenya for this great initiative. Um, it was a successful, it was, it was a success last year, but this year I think it's been a bigger success. We were very impressed at, you know, the quality of the entrepreneurs and the businesses. Um, so a big thank you to you um, and the British government. Um, good. So, I'm not going to, you know, keep the anxiety going any longer. Um, in no particular order, uh, the first five winners, uh, starting with the first one, is Zumi. The second one is Agar. Where are we looking? Oh, we're looking at this one. We're looking at this one. The next one is Mionga. Two to go, no pressure. Hello, tractor. Last one is Victorian Foods. Victorian Foods, now called Value Villages Food and Leather. I actually want to say thank you to everybody uh, who applied. 850 uh, small enterprises applied. The top 10 were here today. That's an incredibly competitive process. You should all feel incredibly proud of what you've achieved. And to the winners, congratulations. But to, to colleagues who haven't quite made it, come back next year, apply again. For all those people out there, all the entrepreneurs know it. You try, you refine, you improve, uh, and you come back again. So. We really, really encourage you uh, to do that, uh, not just here in the room, but colleagues around the country. Thank you very much. We're very, very proud of our partnership, really a modern British partnership with Kenya. And thank you to each and every one of you. How does it feel like to be a winner? Wow. Uh, I feel honored. Um, there were some amazing startups here, and I truly didn't expect to be one of the, one of the winners. Oh, man, this feels so great. I don't believe it, but I thank God. I feel so nice. This is the best feeling ever. I'm excited. I think it's uh, it's a great opportunity for us to not only expand the Hello Tractor story with the standard audience, but also have an injection of capital to grow our business. Oh, well, this feels great. 100,000 pounds more. <laughs> Okay, 100,000 pounds more responsible. So ideally, the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund 
uh, is about testing new innovations and therefore you have two categories of people who can participate. People with existing businesses who are finding new innovative ways to either expand their businesses, to scale their businesses or even to diversify into new products. But you also have startups who are basically looking at starting a new innovation in a novel space and have not gone into businesses themselves. Obviously the consideration amongst the two during the selection process is a bit different, but all these people can participate. Through the Kenya Catalytic Job Fund, technical assistance and grant funding will be provided to organizations with the potential to implement innovative solutions with the potential to create large-scale jobs. Want to know more about the Kenya Catalytic Jobs Fund and be updated on the next call for proposals? Go to www.kenyacatalyticjobsfund.org.